All right, so welcome to lecture six. Um, so this week, we're going to be focusing on security. Um, so we'll learn about the different attacks that some people might uh, launch on your computer, as well as a lot of defenses uh, that we've developed to kind of protect yourself uh, from harm in this scary online world. But first, uh, because today is April Fool's Day, uh, there have been lots of you know, companies and websites running these fun April Fool's Day pranks. Uh, so here are a couple of my favorites, uh, which you might have already seen. Um, so this is from YouTube. Uh, they just launched this video. We are so close to the end. Tonight at midnight, YouTube.com will no longer be accepting entries. After eight amazing years, it is finally time to review everything that has been uploaded to our site and begin the process of selecting a winner. We started YouTube in 2005 as a contest with a simple goal to find the best video in the world. We had no idea we'd get such a great response. You've uploaded over 70 hours of footage every minute, and we've been blown away by the variety, imagination, and anything goes spirit that has driven the competition. We are all storytellers. That's what pulled me into this contest, you know, like stories of how to Photoshop and stories about the Hoppet Trailer HD. I encourage everybody to watch as many videos as possible before YouTube deletes everything tonight. Every video that has been uploaded to our site will be reviewed by our staff of 30,000 technicians. They'll narrow down the submissions and then our Steam panel will select the best video, which will be announced when the website goes back online in 2023 featuring the winner of YouTube and nothing else. Our team of judges is made up of distinguished film critics, YouTube celebrities, and some of our most prolific commenters. Yes, it's a product unboxing, but I think it adds to the product unboxing genre, and it subverts our expectations as an audience. I don't suck, you suck, and so is this video. Look, I'm pretty sure that the first 10 minutes of Citizen Kang is great, but what I love about Epic Skateboard Fail is that it's short, it's funny, and it's straight to the point. But is it the best video on YouTube? We're going to have the same conversation about all 150,000 videos that we watch. It's an amazing process. We always said that this shouldn't be a popularity contest. Gangnam Style has the same chance of winning as a video with 40 views of a man feeding bread to a duck. Of course I'm hoping to win, but even if I've inspired just one person to go out and harass people on the beach, that's something I still feel pretty good about. I'd better win. Otherwise, all those years traveling the world were just an expensive waste of time. So my strategy from day one has always been post as many videos as possible. I mean, it's all about shots on goal. It's important that you keep pushing yourself. We challenge ourselves every day to think of groups of people who could react to some video that people already know about. Hopefully the judges appreciate the risks that we take as artists. When we heard about the contest, we spent months trying to come up with the best idea. Then Charlie bit my finger, and I was like, write that down! I did dancing. My dad put a lot of money into this dental surgery I didn't even need, just so we could win this contest. He'll be really, really upset if we lose. It's not just about the recognition of being the world's best video. As promised, when YouTube started back in 2005, the winner will also walk away with an MP3 player that clips to your sleeve and a $500 stipend for your next creative endeavor. So remember, get all of your last minute submissions in by tonight at midnight. While your work's finished, ours is just beginning. It's gonna be an exciting decade. courtesy to folks at Google and YouTube. Microsoft was actually, I love, so if you go to bing.com right now, and if you search for Google and press enter, you'll get something that looks like this, uh, which is Microsoft's take on the Google homepage. Um, but if you actually hover a little bit, you know, kind of move your mouse a little bit, you see these things down here, uh, which if I read, uh, if blank space is your thing, you could go low tech. And they're basically making fun of the fact that Google's homepage is very bare. You know, a lot of the designs at Google think this is nice, it's minimalist design. Or Microsoft, they happen to have a different opinion. You know, they have that big old Easter Island photo there uh, right now. And so this is just kind of a jab at Google's design sense versus Microsoft's design sense. When there's nothing else to look at, you may take drastic measures. And finally, uh, my favorite, of course, came from Vimeo, uh, which is introducing a new feature, Vimeo. Uh, they basically renamed a bunch of different things in their videos. Uh, like the mouse is an actual mouse, the form is now the litter box, 
uh, and so on. So if you have any awesome, uh, if you find any awesome April Fool stuff, definitely post it to the discussion board. Uh, these things are really fun, I think. So that's that. So today, as we said, we're going to be talking about security. So what is security? So last time you said, you know, we have this multimedia thing. What is that? So this week, what is security? What comes to mind when you hear security? Sure, so antivirus, so what does that mean? Yeah, so we have this, these protections that different people have developed to prevent some malicious attacks. So what else does security mean? What else comes to mind with security? Firewall. firewall. So what's a firewall? Yeah, so a firewall we saw a little, a few weeks ago, is basically a way to either block outgoing or incoming connections to your computer. So someone can't uh, basically take control of it uh, via some hole in your network or something like that. Anything else come to mind? Yeah. Yeah, so encryption, what does that mean? Yeah, so we'll see a lot of encryption in just a moment. Where Encryption, as we said, is basically this way of taking some data that you want to protect. You know, it's sensitive information that you want to make sure no one else finds out about. And you want to somehow uh, encrypt that or scramble it up so that someone who's looking at it can't get that sensitive information that you're trying to protect. So let's start uh, with an example. So let's say that I am a Facebook user, I'm sure many of you are as well, and you log into Facebook.com. So when you log into Facebook.com, you're probably going to type in your username and your password, and then Facebook's going to know who you are. You'll see your name in the top right hand corner. Uh, and as you traverse from page to page to page, you're not going to have to log in every time, right? It'd be really annoying if you had to log in when you looked at your newsfeed, then go to your profile, you have to log in again, then look at your friend's profile, log in again. Like, that'd be really annoying. So somehow, once you log in once, Facebook is remembering who you are. And that remembering starts something called a session. And a session is basically this, this connection between you and Facebook. You're sharing some information, and Facebook is remembering who you are as you navigate their site. So Facebook remembers who you are via these little tiny files in your computer called cookies. So cookies are just these small text files that are managed by your web browser that can store some information from the server. So Facebook.com can say, hey, web browser, I want you to take this little piece of data and store it in a cookie file on the user's computer. So what is going inside of this cookie file? Well, we're going to need some kind of unique identifier for your session. So once I log into Facebook, Facebook can randomly select this long string of characters. It's going to say, this is the identifier for your session. So that identifier could be something like one, two, three, or it could be a long list of letters. And when someone else logs into Facebook.com, they're going to get a different session identifier. So that means that if somehow I get the same session identifier as someone else, I can basically trick Facebook into thinking that I'm not who I say I am. Right? If Bob has the session ID 456, and suddenly I log in and Facebook says, oh, my my, Tommy's uh, session ID is now going to be 456, suddenly Bob is going to be me. Right? Because if Bob still is telling Facebook, hey, I'm 456, and now that 456 corresponds to my login, then suddenly we're going to run into some problems. I can basically trick Facebook into thinking that I'm someone else. So here's how uh, this is actually implemented. So this uh, is an HTTP request that we could be sending to Facebook.com. So down the bottom here, we have this new key value pair that we didn't see last time, this thing called the cookie. So this value here is the actual information that's been stored somewhere in a tiny text file in my web browser. So over here to the right, we have this long looking kind of random string of characters. And so this is some unique identifier for my session. So that means that every time I go to a page on Facebook, I don't need to log in again because I'm going to include this in every single request I make. So if I go, for example, from my newsfeed to my profile, I'm going to remind Facebook who I am via this unique identifier. So once Facebook gets this cookie, this session ID, Facebook can say, OK, I remember that. I remember that I gave this unique identifier to Tommy. Because whoever this is sent me this unique identifier, well, that must be Tommy, right? Because this is this random long string of characters that'd be really hard to guess. Some kind of proving that I'm Tommy by supplying this session identifier. So once Facebook gets that, it can pull up information that it's stored, like the name associated with the session, you know, my friends, or anything else um, that it wants to save. 
So that's how I'm going to be remembered as I traverse from page to page on the same website. I'm just going to keep sending along the string of characters to keep reminding the server who I am. So does that concept make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so what happens if, for example, we clear our browsing data or clear our history or that we'll clear our cookies while we're on Facebook? Then Facebook is going to ask us to log in again, right? Because if we send along a request that doesn't have a session along with it, Facebook's going to say, well, you must not be logged in because you're not giving me your session identifier, so I can just ask you to log in again, and I'll get a new session ID this time. Yeah, so do you get a different uh, cookie every time? So that kind of depends, right? So if I log into Facebook and then shut down my computer and come back a week later and open it up, I might still be logged in. And this is something that the server can actually determine. The server can say, well, this cookie can last a week or a month or a year. And that's something that Facebook chose. You know, Facebook has obviously picked some really big value because it's super annoying to have to log in every time you, you open up your laptop. Um, but as soon as I log out and log in again, that's when I'm probably going to get assigned a new session identifier, since it's just this totally random thing. And the reason it's random is to make it really hard to guess. But if someone does guess what my session identifier is, then I'm going to run into some problems. And this is called session hijacking. So as we said before, you know, if, I, if my session ID is just 123, and then Bob comes along and he writes an HTTP request, and he writes cookie, Session ID equals 123. As far as Facebook is concerned, that request came from me, because Bob was able to figure out my unique session identifier. And there's really nothing else that Bob needs to do to trick Facebook into thinking that he's someone else. So this is called session hijacking, basically taking advantage of an already established session to kind of piggyback onto that and impersonate another user. So you know, if Bob is attacking me, he doesn't need to know my password, he doesn't even know my, need to know my username, my email. As soon as he figures out this session ID, he can impersonate me, and that's really, really bad. So some solutions to session hijacking, or before some solutions actually, so there's actually a program uh, that we can run to actually see uh, exactly what's going on on a network. Uh, so we saw this in a section video, the one called Sniffing TCP IP Packets. So definitely check that out if you haven't already. Uh, but just to refresh what this looks like, once I click Start, I can actually see here a list of every single packet that's traveling around this network. So that means that if I'm Bob and Alice is on Facebook and Alice makes an HTTP request to Facebook, suddenly I can see that HTTP request go over the network. And we just saw that inside of that HTTP request is exactly something that looks like this. And so now, simply by running a program like this to kind of sniff what's going on around the network, if this is just transmitted you know, out in the clear, then it's really easy for me to hijack someone's session. Right? In this little program, it's going to be right there. And it's all it takes for me is to start using that, and I can impersonate the user whose session that is. So obviously, uh, that's not so good. So one defense against this is this thing called HTTPS. So if you've ever logged into Facebook or Google, you might have noticed a little uh, green padlock or something, or yellow padlock, right to the left of your address bar. And so that's just your browser's way of telling you that this site is using something called HTTPS, whereas you might guess that S stands for? Yeah, security. So this is a secure site. So what does that mean? So we saw that the big problem with sending the session identifier out over the clear, over a network, that someone could just look at it and take it. So what HTTPS is going to do is it's going to avoid that problem by not just transmitting that session ID in the clear, but doing something called encrypting it, or scrambling that information so that me, as a user on the network running this program, when I see the HTTP request go through, it's just going to look like meaningless garbage. It's just going to be you know, kind of scrambled text, and I'm not going to be able to figure out you know, what the session ID is, or maybe even not even what the user is doing. And so this is one way that we can defend against this. Uh, so a few years ago, um, this wasn't so common. Uh, and sites like Google and Facebook would only run HTTPS when you logged in. Right? And their, their logic there was that, OK, well, when you log in, you're going to be transmitting not uh, your username and your password you know, across in the clear. So we definitely want to encrypt that. Because you know, if someone's watching, you know, we don't want them to be able to figure out your password. But the problem is, is if you don't use HTTPS on the rest of the pages on the website, 
then suddenly you're going to start transmitting the session identifier, which is really just as bad as someone's password, as far as an attacker is concerned, uh, because they can actually get into your account. So HTTPS then uses a thing called cryptography to do something like this. So we can take a normal looking HTTP request like this, and here you might have a cookie that I can read, and it's going to run it through some process to encrypt it. And what we're going to get back is just the result of me mashing on my keyboard uh, to get some totally scrambled piece of text. And so now this is what an observer on the network would actually see. But once the server gets this, the server can run this process called a decryption. And we'll see some ways the server can actually do this in just a moment. Um, but the decryption is going to take this totally random garbled text and translate it back into something that the server can actually work with. So we can see here that HTTPS isn't any different way of communicating than HTTP. Right? It's really just this additional layer. Right? We haven't changed any of the rules of our protocol. We still looks like we still have the word get and the path and the version and all that. That's all exactly the same. We're only adding this additional layer of security on top of it. So now we're going to take that data in that same format. And before we send it off, we're just going to encrypt it so that if anyone is watching, they can't actually do anything with that information. So any questions on how that works at a high level? OK, so you know, I'm on a site, and I notice in the address bar that rather than saying HTTPS you know, colon slash slash example.com, I see HTTP colon slash slash example.com. So does that mean I can just add an S and kind of start using HTTPS? Yes or no? No, why not? Yeah, exactly. So it's not just my decision whether or not I want to use HTTPS. So we see here that both the, the web browser and the site have to be sharing some kind of information, right? They kind of have to be on the same page. Because I can look at this text and I see garbage, but the server is somehow looking at this text and it's not seeing garbage. So that means that this has to be a feature that's actually enabled on the server. The server has to do something in order to allow you to start using HTTPS. So that being said, a server might uh, support HTTPS, but you can also use, if you want, HTTP over that server. So although a server might support it, they might not force you to use uh, HTTPS. And so are there really any reasons why you wouldn't want to use HTTPS? Yeah? Would it allow privileges to a third party? So to allow privileges to a third party. So that's interesting. And so that's actually something we're going to look at next week. Um, we talk about identities and authentication. Um, but there are actually ways, um, algorithms and techniques we've actually figured out that would allow a third party to still use um, your information, kind of like an API or a Facebook app. There are actually ways that we can still do that using HTTPS, just using some fancy techniques uh, that we'll see a little bit later. So really, there isn't right now a reason why you wouldn't want to use HTTPS. You know, it, it is technically a little bit slower. Because you know, we need to encrypt this information. The server needs to encrypt all of its contents back. So if you're downloading a big image, it, it download a big image or something like that, it needs to be encrypted. Um, but really now, servers have gotten pretty fast. And we figured out pretty fast ways to encrypt and decrypt data. So it's true that there is a little bit of a performance hit. But if you have the choice between you know, the page loading 0. 0.0001 seconds slower and a huge security vulnerability that could bring down your entire company, you're probably going to pick the first one. And so now a lot of sites have started using HTTPS on all of the different pages on their website, which is a really good thing. So however, you know, some sites might not use HTTPS. And if that's the case, then you kind of don't want to be out of luck. Right? So a lot of us are going to be using wireless now, you know, whether it be on our home network or at our work. You know, most people are on wireless networks. And so we can, as we saw in a section video a little bit earlier, we can secure our wireless network. And the idea behind Wi-Fi security is basically the same exact thing as HTTPS. Before we send out information publicly over this network that anyone can see, we're going to encrypt it. And then, um, before the server gets it, it'll be decrypted. So that means that you know, as I'm just looking at the network, even if a page is not using HTTPS, because now the network is handling the encryption, then that means I still have no idea what's going on. So a few uh, options for Wi-Fi security are these here. So we have WEP, WPA, WPA2. We saw these a little bit earlier. Uh, but the takeaway here is that these are just different ways of encrypting your information. And unfortunately, some of these are better than others. So WEP, for example, happens to be totally cracked. 
Right? It turns out it, it wasn't really a, a good idea in the first place. And if someone is just sitting there on a network and they don't know the password, and without the password, that means they can't decrypt any information. So even if I don't know the password, if I just sit there and look at enough packets as they're going through the network, I can actually figure out what the password to encrypt that data actually was. So that means I can figure out the password and then join the network. So once I've joined a network with Wi-Fi security, you know, I've provided the WPA2 password, a web password, then you know, the encryption isn't really helping us anymore. Because right? once I have the password, I can decrypt any of the information that's going around the network. So the Wi-Fi security is really just to keep out uh, prying eyes you don't trust to be on your network in the first place. But of course, you do run the risk uh, of someone cracking into your network. You know, if it's using an insecure password, or basically they just keep trying enough passwords and they figure it out. Um, so Wi-Fi, you know, if you're on a secure Wi-Fi network, you know, that's not a reason to not use HTTPS, for example. So when we talk about all these security things, you know, we'll see a lot of different techniques. Um, but it's really a good idea to use as many of these techniques as you possibly can. You know, Wi-Fi security isn't a substitute for HTTPS, and you know, not vice versa. Because you kind of want to put up as many layers of defense as you possibly can. Because right? someone could break down any one of the barriers that you've set up. And if there are even more barriers that are protecting your information, then you're going to be a lot better off. So just the takeaway here is that Wi-Fi security can be used to encrypt information that's going around a wireless network. So that means that someone who doesn't have the password to your network, so you don't trust them, they can't actually view what's going on. So any questions on Wi-Fi security? OK. So now let's talk about a few different attacks um, that we can launch via web pages. So we're first going to focus on uh, kind of these online attacks that you might find on the internet. And then later, we'll kind of focus on attacks to your data, like viruses and things like that. So this thing here uh, is called CSERF. Does anyone happen to know what this stands for? So this is cross-site request forgery. Uh, pronounced CSERF, even th though there's no U. And so what a CSERF attack does is it takes advantage of the fact that a lot of sites like Facebook, will, you know, as we saw earlier, will leave you logged in even after you leave the page. So if I'm on Facebook, you know, I just close my tab and go to a different website. You know, my session with Facebook is still active. And I know that's the case, because if I open up a new tab and go to Facebook, I'm not asked to log in again. So that means that that session identifier that Facebook has given me is still somehow valid. So it means I can keep using it, and Facebook is going to remember who I am. So CSERF, then, is going to take advantage of that. So let's say that I'm on, I do some online banking with bank.com, which sounds like a very reputable bank. And I notice that on bank.com, my browser has this nice, shiny green padlock. I see HTTPS, and I'm totally good to go, because this bank is super secure. You know, with a name like bank.com, they must be. So I go to transfer some money. And I want to transfer some money to my savings account, to my checking account, or something. And when I click the transfer button, you know, I'm, I'm an E1 student, and it's like, oh, I know all about URLs. I'm just going to take a look at what's going on. And I see this URL inside of my web browser. I see bank.com, blah, blah, blah. You know, something about transferring. So that means it's probably something on the web page that's actually doing the transfer there. And I see this thing down here, which is the query string. So remember, this was some way of sending the server some information that it can use to process our request. So we can see here that this 2, whoop, this 2 here, this is probably like my bank account number. Now, luckily, this isn't actually my bank account number. Um, but so this is telling the server, OK, where is the money going to be transferred to? Then here's how much money I want to transfer, maybe. I want to transfer $100 or something like that. And the account that's being transferred from is taken from my session. Because I logged in, and the bank's going to remember, OK, Tommy just logged into his savings account. And now he's going to transfer money somewhere else. So I don't need to have kind of a from parameter here, because that's just going to be taken from the session. And the reason that is because the bank can trust that if I had the ability to log into my bank account, then I must have the ability to say it's OK to transfer money. Right? If, if, they, if I could just have a from parameter here that said something like from equals 1, 2, 3, and 2 equals 6, 7, 8, then anyone could put any values they want inside of that URL and kind of you know, transfer money. So if your bank does that, uh, you'd probably switch banks. But this one is a little bit nicer, because it knows that the, where it's coming from must come from some authenticated session. OK, so I, I, I log in this bank, and I close my tab, and I'm going to go to some other site. So this other site is owned by someone who also uses bank.com, and they also made this observation about the URL. 
So what they're going to do is they're going to put a link on their page, or an, an image, or anything else on their page that changes this to this value here, this 6789. They're going to change that to their bank account number. So now, when I go to this bad guy's website, and I click on that link, or, or really I just visit it, what's going to happen? Yeah, so what's, gonna, what's basically going to happen then is I'm about to transfer money into someone else's bank account without me even knowing. Right? If suddenly you know, I click a link and all it takes to transfer money is to visit a link like this and whoever is currently logged in is, is going to lose some money. If someone else puts this link on their page with their bank account number and I click it, then if I'm still logged in, I just got attacked and I just lost a lot of money. So it doesn't even have to be me clicking on something. It's kind of hard to see in this diagram here, but basically what we have down here is a, is a web page with an image. And so it's loading an image, but it's actually not an image. This URL, the source of this image, or where the browser is trying to download the image from, is actually a URL that is a URL that will transfer money to someone's bank account. So just by virtue of visiting this page, if I'm logged into my bank account, I just lost money to this attacker, which is not so good. And so this is called CSERF. So any questions on the, how that attack works? OK, so let's look at a different attack vector. Or first, first before we do that, uh, let's solve this problem, <laughs> rather than leaving bank.com uh, totally cowering in fear. So the way to solve this problem is with these things called CSERF tokens. So the problem with CSERF is we basically said, you know, given this URL, if I'm logged in, I'm just going to go through with the transfer and no questions asked. So instead, what we can do is we can generate this other random token. So in addition to my session ID, I've also generated this random token here. And the server has said, OK, if you want to transfer money from Tommy's bank account, you need to tell me what this token is. And so this token is going to come from the bank account's web page. So that means that I'm the only one who can actually view this token. And the only way for me to get this token is to somehow actually log in as me and have access to that bank account's web page. So for example, if you actually go to a real bank, uh, like Bank of America, uh, there's a little piece of code on their website inside of their HTML, which we'll see in just a bit, that looks like this. And what this is doing is it's saying, on the login page, here is this token that the server has generated for you. The only way that you can log in or transfer money or anything like that is if you tell me what the token that I told you is. So a, C for a CSERF attacker on you know, badguy.com has no way of figuring out this CSERF token. So this one here, this token happens to be 12345. So the only way I can transfer money is if I tell the server my token is 12345. So now there's no way for someone else to kind of uh, take advantage of me unless they either figure out my token or guess it uh, or something like that. Yeah? Yeah, so this is similar in spirit to a site key. So for example, on, you know, on, on Bank of America, when I log in, you know, I, I get presented with a picture of a turtle. And I don't know why, it just happened to be like the first image that I could pick when I signed up. And then you know, the, the person sitting next to me who was helping me sign up said, OK, now you have to figure out a caption for the turtle. I had to come up with a caption. And basically, the whole, that whole process is basically making sure that you know that you're on bankofamerica.com. Right? You know, if I'm on vancofamerica.com or something, you know, they're going to have to figure out my site key and my picture and my caption and you know, God knows what else um, in order to uh, actually you know, create the same experience as bankofamerica.com. So you know, kind of like phishing. If someone convinces you that you know, you're actually going to an OK website, it's actually sketchy, you're from a fake email address, that's kind of the same idea. So it's proving that you're actually on Bank of America, you know, you're logging into the right bank. Um, the CSERF token is, is very similar in spirit. You know, the only way to actually uh, take money out of my account is to give me something, prove to me that you're um, coming from the correct place. OK, so we'll come back to that in just a moment. But let's talk about a different uh, attack vector now. So this one is called XSS, or cross-site scripting. 
So while CSERF took advantage of some problem on the server, because you know, the server is being a little too trustworthy with its sessions, XSS is going to take advantage of a problem on the client. So the root of XXS is that when I go to a web page and I can pick a username, you know, you know, most normal people are just going to pick a username like Tommy or something like that. But we know that web pages are written in this thing called HTML. And so in order to display a web page, I might write some HTML that looks like this. And so now when I log into Facebook.com, there's probably a bit, of, a bit of code that's executed that says whatever the user's name is, just put it right here. So what if, as my username, I pick this? That means that the server is going to say, OK, whatever Tommy's username is, I'm going to print it out on the page. So if my username just contains some HTML, that means that I'm actually going to kind of mess with the aesthetics of the page. Right? My, my name is something going to be displayed really big if the server isn't being careful about what it displays. So by simply kind of injecting code into this website, I can do some pretty bad things. Um, so one such bad thing is I can steal other people's cookies. So we know that these cookies uh, store some information and they're stored by the web browser. And so I can access that information by the web browser. So if I you know, pick as my username or somehow get some code onto someone's website, I can basically say, everyone who visits this site, send me your cookie because my username is this crazy piece of code. So if the website isn't being careful with what they let me pick as my username, I can pick some code that can actually steal some information, which is really bad. So let's take a look at an example. And if you have a laptop, uh, feel free to play along. So I have here on cse1.net slash lecture6 a super secure E1 discussion board. So if I log in, if I log in correctly, I can pick Tommy and Tommy. Or I register first. So I'm going to register a new user, and that link's not going to work either because I just changed it. So I'm going to pick for my username, I'm going to be E1, and my password is going to be E1. So when I click Submit, you know, I just logged in. So you see here I say, hi E1, the server is remembering who I am. So if I type something, I can say hello, and now it's going to submit my post. So this is kind of you know, what a normal person might do as they're using this web page. So now what if instead of just posting hello, if I post some HTML? So if I post hello like this. And so we saw that this is basically some HTML that says have some, have some big text. Now when I post, well, you know, I just kind of took advantage of something here. The server is displaying whatever I typed in. And I typed in some information that's going to um, make the text bigger. So that's not really that harmful. Um, but what if I type in something like this? So this is a bit of code that's now going to execute for every single person who views this page. So when I click Submit, I just created a pop-up on this page just by creating this blog post. So this is super annoying. Right? So now everyone who visits this page is going to get this really annoying pop-up. And so what I've done is I've just injected some code into this website. And because I'm not being careful about what I display, I can really ruin some people's lives. And so for example, you know, I can do something a little bit more destructive, uh, like change If I submit this, now I just made the entire page blue. You know, we can see you know, how to actually write the code to do all of these things. But the reason that I can have so much control over this web page is because someone isn't being careful about exactly uh, what information they're allowing to be posted and displayed. Um, so let me just get rid of that so we can make this readable again. OK, that's OK. So let's look at the actual source code of this web page to figure out what this is doing. So we can see here that this is basically a form. And in that form, I basically just have this one little text box. And this text box name is post. So when I actually send some information to the server, the HTTP request that's going to be generated is going to look like this. So notice here how I'm using a get request. I'm not using post. So that means that the URL that I'm going to visit looks like this. So when I visit this URL, 
what this web page is going to do is it's going to say, OK, whoever's logged in right now, I want you to create a post with this contents. So what happens then if I'm a bad guy and I put a link on my site that looks like this? So cse1.net slash lecture6 slash post.php. Tommy is the best. So what's going to happen if you log into cse1.net, you know, you play around with this fun little web page, and then you close the tab and you go to someone else's site, and it contains a link like this. What's going to happen? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. What this is going to do is it's going to post Tommy is the best to the discussion board, even though I never did that. right? Because I was still logged in and somebody figured out, well, if I want to post information, all I do is go to post this post.php URL and supply a key of post and a value of whatever I want. Whoever is currently logged in is going to post that information. So even if this link is on a totally different site and I click it or somehow it's you know, automatically clicked for me, then that's going to affect what happens on this totally different website. That's why we have this notion of cross-site request forgery. Some other attacker is forging a request. They're pretending to be me, and they're taking advantage of the fact that I'm still logged in on this other server. So does that make sense? Any questions on how I could be attacked this way? OK, and so XSS was just a little bit different. Rather than uh, taking advantage of the server, we're just kind of exploiting the client. Uh, and we're, saying, we're figuring out that you know, maybe the server is a little too generous with what it allows us to actually display. So we can attack someone or make the page blue that way. So that's kind of you know, the, the front end of web pages. But let's talk a little bit about how websites actually store your information. So typically, websites will organize your information to these things called databases. So has anyone ever worked with a database at work or anything like that that can kind of explain what a database is? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So a, a database, you know, as you said, it's just kind of this repository of information. It's kind of organized in some structured way. And so one way that it could be organized could look like this. So let's say that I'm running a pet store, and I want to have an inventory of all the different pets inside of my pet store. So that means I'm going to have a database. And inside of this database, I'm going to have a bunch of different tables of information. So this is kind of like an Excel spreadsheet. You know, you might have multiple uh, different sheets on your Excel spreadsheet, and each sheet could represent something totally different. So the big Excel file then could be kind of like our database. So here's just kind of one sheet in our Excel spreadsheet, or just one table that our database contains. So you can see here that with a table, and I can specify what columns I have in my table. So this is gonna, everything in here is going to be a name. Everything in here is going to be a date of birth. And notice here, where everything here is kind of words, but everything in this column here is a date. So usually I can specify what type of information can go into a column. And after I specified columns, somebody can come in and enter in rows. And each row then is going to define a value for each of these columns. And so this actually happens to be the birthday of Grumpy Cat, which is coming up. Uh, so be sure to celebrate this week. And so now, this is how we can represent some information inside of our database. So that's nice. You know, it's kind of abstract. So how do we actually access this information if we're a website? So one way to do this um, that's become pretty popular is this thing called SQL, or SQL, or SQL. There's a bunch of different pronunciations. Um, but it stands for Structured Query Language. You know, and as this name suggests, this is basically just some text-based way for us to ask questions about the database. So we might want to ask, for example, how many cats do we have? How many indoor cats do we have? Or we might want to say something that's not really a question, um, but I want to add a new cat to the database. And so let's just run through a few different examples of SQL. So if I have this table of cats, and I want to actually get, for example, you know, all of the names of the cats in my pet store. I can run a query that looks like this. So if I jump over here, 
So here is the same exact database that we just saw. So we can see here that we just have a table, some columns, and some rows. And now I actually want to pull down some information from this database. And so if I click on SQL here, this is just a text area where I can start typing some questions. So the first thing I want to type is I want to tell the database, what do I want to do? Well, I want to select some information from my database. So what information do I want to select? Well, I'm just interested in the name of all the cats in my database. So now, what am I selecting from? Right? We said our database can have a bunch of different tables. So one for cats, one for dogs, and one for birds, or you know, whatever. So now I want to say that I want to select the name from a table called cats. And so this is a really simple query. It's a question we're asking the database. And now when I come over here and I click Go, I'm going to get something that looks like this. So the database answered my question. It said, here are all of the names for all of the cats inside of the database. So that's a little bit boring. You know, we haven't really done anything there. We've just kind of filtered uh, our database. So let's try asking a different question. So this time, I want to figure out all of the different indoor cats in my database. So a customer just came in. They're interested in indoor cat. So I want to tell them what all their options are. So again, the first thing I want to type is the word select, because I want to select some information from the database. Well, what do I want to select? Well, I kind of just want to select everything. So I'm just going to type a star. So that says now I want to get all of the columns from my table. We're still coming from the same table, still spelled wrong, called cats. But now I don't want everything. I only want to select those cats where I have a value of indoor for that column called preference. So I want to say where my preference is indoor. So this is a bit of a different query. It's a little, a little more complex. I'm saying I want to get all the cats where this thing here is a true statement for the row. So I'm not going to get all the rows back anymore. Now if I click on Go, now I only got back two of these three rows. Notice here the preference for both of these is indoor. So this is you know, just a, a SQL way of interacting with my database. So let's try something else. Let's say that I want to actually add a new cat to the database. So now I, I'm no longer interested in selecting some existing information. I want to add some new ones. So the first thing I want to type is now the word insert. OK, so what I want to insert? I want to insert into the cats table. So what do I want to insert? Well, I'm going to give each cat a name, a date of birth. Let me zoom out a little bit. Color and a preference. So now I'm simply saying, OK, these are all the columns that I'm going to tell you about. And so now I want to tell you about the new cat that I'm inserting. So let's give our cat a name. Well, maybe the cat was born hypothetically, totally. I didn't look it up. On this day, you know, the cat's gray. And now we have an outdoor cat. So now, again, we have a different query. We're now inserting some information into our database. So if I run this now, click Go, and I come back to my database, we now have another cat. So those are just a couple examples of, of things your website might actually be doing behind the scenes. These are queries that it's actually running on the database you know, to pull your Facebook profile information, to add a new friend, or something like that. So some other quick examples uh, that aren't as interesting. You know, if you want to uh, edit an existing row, that's totally fine. And we can update some information. Or if we want to you know, delete a row because we sold this cat to a happy new home, then we can say something like delete. I want to delete from the cat's table uh, where I have this matching name. So SQL then is just kind of this, it's not really a programming language. It's just kind of a, a way of interacting with the database. And it's basically a way of standardized way of asking questions about the information in a database. So the four things that we can essentially do then with a database is this acronym here, which is great, CRUD. So based on the four things we just did, we did select, insert, update, and delete. If the C stands for create, does anyone guess what the R stands for? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's a good guess. So revise, close. That's actually going to be the U. Retrieve, yeah, so retrieve or read. So both of those we, we commonly said. So that's when we selected new information. So this U, as you just said, is for updating information. And how about the D? 
Yeah, so delete. So these then are really the four things that we can do with a database. We just kind of illustrated two out of those four because I was getting bored. And unfortunately, you know, SQL doesn't happen to use these words. It decided it'd be a good idea to make up its own words. And so these are the four things, the four basic things that we can do with a SQL database. Insert, select, update, and delete. Okay. So the, the pet shop was nice, um, but let's come to an actual example that, you know, a query that might actually be run, you know, every day for you. So on Facebook, they might run a query that looks something like this. You know, I don't know what they're actually running, you know, and never having looked at Facebook's code, but it might look something like this. So when I click on Mark Zuckerberg's profile, you know, a query like this might be run. I want to select all of Mark's information, and only where the username is Zuck, which happens to be uh, his username on Facebook. So what this will do is this will just pull down all of Mark Zuckerberg's information. So when I go to log into Facebook, I'm going to run a similar query, but when I click on profile, I'm not going to get the information for Mark Zuckerberg. So really then, I'm kind of asking, I'm kind of filling in the blanks into an existing query. And so here's a statement here. So let's kind of come, step away from Facebook for a moment. Uh, so no more SQL, and we're just kind of back in the real world. So let's say that I run a grill. And the way you order food at the grill is you order, I give you a little slip of paper, you fill it in, you give it back to me, and I give you some delicious burgers. So the slip of, for, the slip of paper that you fill out looks something like this. You say, I, I would like blank cheeseburgers, so you put a number here, tell me how they're cooked, and you tell me what you want on them. So if you're a normal, a normal person, you probably fill it out with something like this. So I have this existing query, this existing structure that you're going to plug values into. So you might want two cheeseburgers cooked medium well on top with lettuce, in which case your burger is kind of boring. But I'll give it to you anyway, because we aim to please here. But notice uh, this last one, this, this toppings. And what I could have done was I could have given you some check boxes, for example. You could have checked off lettuce and checked off tomato or, or whatever else. But I didn't. What I did here is I gave you a blank, and I let you fill in that blank with pretty much anything you wanted. And so perhaps the problem with this approach is that someone could fill in the blanks like this. Right? This, the, the customer here hasn't broken any rules. They've broken a lot of social norms, but they haven't broken any rules. I've given them a set of blanks to fill in, and they just filled in those blanks with whatever they want. So this obviously isn't so good. Right? I've been totally taken advantage of if I'm supposed to be blindly following whatever the customer tells me to do. So now, you know, the customer kind of attacked me by anticipating what my query looked like and filling in some values that would result in something bad. So does that make sense, kind of how I just got exploited here by allowing the customer to type in kind of whatever they wanted? Okay. So this is called injection. The customer has injected some kind of bad behavior into my otherwise very nice system. So if we come back to our Facebook example, you know, we're, we're back at this query here, where this blank now is going to be filled in with whatever username I picked. So for me, the username might be Tommy, it might for someone else be Alice or Bob. And this is kind of, again, what normal people would do. You know, they just pick a normal username. But what if someone picks this as their username? And so this looks totally bizarre. Like, why on earth would you want a username that looks like this? So you notice here it looks a little bit like the SQL that we just wrote. You know, we have like an equal signs, those look familiar. We have some kind of quotes, those look kind of familiar. So let's say that someone is allowed to register this username. And again, the website is just going to blindly evaluate that query. It has no idea what the query is going to do, because it's just going to plug in whatever the user tells it for that blank. So when we plug in this value, we get something that looks like this. So in yellow, I've literally just replaced that blank with what I picked for my username. So what does this look like now? It looks like a, a different query than what we were going to do in the first place. So let's say that you're a database and you get a query that looks like this, and you're going to run this. So anyone have any guesses as to, as to what this will do? Or not guesses, but try to figure it out. So I'm selecting everything from this table called profiles, and my condition now, the what rows I'm selecting now, looks like this, where the username is nothing or 1 equals 1. So what is that going to do?
Yeah, so this is definitely taking advantage of some kind of security vulnerability. So the question is, what's going to happen when this is evaluated? So let's say I'm at a row, and I'm at Mark Zuckerberg's row. So in order for me, you know, as a database, I'm either going to give you this row, or I'm not going to give you this row. So the way that I'm going to give you this row is if this thing in the where part of the query is true. So is Mark Zuckerberg's username, is Zuck equal to something that's blank, yes or no? No, the word Zuck and the word nothing are different words. Okay, but let's look at the second half. Is the number one equal to the number one? Yes, if that's not true, then we have bigger problems than injection in our databases. So that means, am I going to return the row for Mark Zuckerberg, yes or no? Yes, okay, so now I'm next in line, I'm in the database. My username is Tommy, is Tommy equal to nothing? No, is one equal to one? Yes, so do I get returned? Yes, so that means that by picking this as my username, I've just totally exposed Facebook's entire database. So when Facebook goes to try to get my information, it's actually going to get everyone's information because of what I've chosen as my username. Right? I've ch just picked this malicious thing that when you plug it into this existing query structure, it's going to do something that Facebook really doesn't want me to do, which is bad. Because that means that regardless of privacy settings or friendships or all these other things that Facebook set up, I can view everything in the database because I've used this injection. So let's try another one. So let's say, you know, when I log in, the process of logging in looks something like this. So I want to have this thing called users, and everyone has a username and a password. So to check if I've supplied the correct password, I'm going to look for this username password pair in my database. So if Tommy has a password of cats, this query is going to return my row only if I've supplied the correct password. Right, because if I have, if I supply as my password dogs, for example, the right answer is cats. Then this query is going to say select star from users where Tommy's my username and the password is dogs. But there's no row in the database for which that's true, because there's only one Tommy and his password is cats. So the only way for this to return anything is if I've supplied the correct username and password. Does everyone kind of understand what this query is doing? Okay, so let's do this. So I'm really difficult, and I take that same thing that we had before, and I pick it as my password. So now let's run this query. So I want to get the row from my database where the username is RJ and this thing here. So now we're saying either the password is empty or 1 equals 1. So let's say that RJ's password is dogs. So I'm a database. I get this query. I find RJ's row. Now I'm going to look at the value for the password column. So I typed in as my password whatever, and the correct answer uh, is whatever you just said it was, E1. So the passwords don't match. So does that mean that RJ's password is blank, yes or no? No, RJ has a password, so his password is not blank. But now is 1 equal to 1? Yes. So what gets returned by this query? Yeah, exactly. RJ's row gets returned by this query. Right? Because we looked at RJ's row and we asked a few questions. We said, is the password blank? Well, the password's not blank, but 1 is equal to 1. And so that means that we can return this row because this thing here is a true statement. Either his password was blank or 1 was equal to 1. So that means that I just logged in as RJ without having any idea what his password was. So that means what if I plugged in uh, for example, I plugged in username equals Ben, and I typed the same exact password. What would happen? Yeah, exactly. So now I just logged in as Ben. And so this is a huge security problem. right? I can now log in as whoever the heck I want just because I specified this magic incantation of a password. Question? Yeah, so exactly. So let's, let's kind of break this down a little bit more. So we want to make sure that everything after this word where is a true statement. So we have two things that have to be true. The first thing that has to be true is the username has to be RJ. So that's the first half. So we've satisfied that because RJ exists, and I've said username RJ. 
So the second half is this thing here. But now, because I'm using this word or, I have two choices of what could be true. So either I supplied the correct password. If I supplied the correct password, then, I've then both halves of this are true. But if I haven't supplied the correct password, but it is true that 1 equals 1, then I've also satisfied this kind of second half. You know, because one of these things is true. So that means that I'm going to return that row every single time. Does that answer your question? So any other questions on, on how this is working? Because it's kind of confusing what's going on here. We're basically you're, you're taking this literal statement. We're saying, is this true or not? And because I picked this crazy thing, I'm making it true. So let's look at one more thing that I might want to do. So let's say now uh, that I pick as my username something that looks like this. So this over here, so ignoring the first couple things, just this part here, this looks like a SQL query. Any guesses as what this query would do? Yeah. Yeah, so it's actually going to delete all the profiles. Yeah, so we, we said I want to delete from this profiles table, but I haven't said which profile I want to delete, so I'm just going to delete them all. So now uh, I picked this as my username uh, because I'm really mad at Facebook. So now uh, let's plug this in to that query before. So now we're going to say I want you to delete from the profiles or select from the profiles nothing. That's not going to do anything. But now the semicolon is going to say, OK, wait a second. I actually have another query that I want you to run. So after you've selected nothing, I want you to do something else. And that something else is going to be, I want you to delete all the information in this table. So this last part here, this, this dash dash, whoop, is just to make uh, this query valid, because we have like this extra quote over here. And so we're just kind of saying, ignore that extra quote. I want you to stop after you delete everyone's information on Facebook. And so here, what we've done is, we've, again, we've, we've specified as our username something malicious because we kind of had a guess as to what Facebook was doing. We said, OK, I want you to now, I've tricked Facebook into saying, I'm going to select someone who doesn't even exist, and that doesn't do anything. And after they don't do anything, they're going to wipe their entire database. So any questions on how this one worked? Yeah. Yeah, so, so this delete is going to happen even if this, this select doesn't select anything. Yeah, so this says that I don't care what the previous query did. Here's a new one. So this is, yeah, this will always execute. We could also say, you know, username equals RJ, and it would be the same thing. Yeah. So, yeah, so it will, so SQL will actually define um, if it will do and or or first. And so we're gonna, what this is going to do is it's going to split it up into two halves. So it's going to look at the or first. We could also specify parentheses to make sure that you know, it works out OK. But the way this will be evaluated is uh, the bad one, basically. It will do the or first, get a value for that, true or false. It'll look at the other one there, say that's true or false, and then finish up. That's a good question, though. So now that we've deleted all of Facebook, that's a pretty big problem. Right, this isn't just a kaboom. Uh, this is like a return of the Jedi, Death Star is blown up kind of boom. And so really then, all of this damage could happen because we were allowed to kind of type in whatever we wanted into these SQL queries. And the server is just blindly evaluating them and because they kind of trust the users to type in something nice. So we're going to take a five-minute break. Uh, but after that, we're going to resolve this problem uh, so we know that you know, why you can't actually type this into Facebook and delete all of Facebook's information. So we'll come back in five minutes. OK, welcome back. So we just saw some examples of SQL injection. And this can definitely be kind of confusing. Um, so you might, they're all in the recap exactly you know, what's getting plugged in. Um, so try to work through them on uh, your head to make sure you can kind of see exactly what's going on. Um, but just to show you that these actually work, uh, let's actually perform a SQL injection uh, on our super, our super secure discussion board. So just so you know that I'm not lying, um, this is what the database actually looks like right now on the discussion board. So by the way, if you do register an account, please don't use your, an actual password that you use in other places, uh, because I will see it. So here's what we look like. 
And we have, we have four users here. Uh, my username, the one I just created now, we have this username E1 and this password E1. So the password that I chose is actually E1, and that's what's stored in the database. We'll see later that that's kind of a bad idea too. But beside the point, so if I jump back to the super secure discussion board, and I click log in. So I'm going to pick, as my username, I'm going to pick E1. And so now as my password, I'm going to choose this. So remember, this is exactly what we were talking about before. I have this quote, and then I'm going to type in something that is always true. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to come back here. I'm going to paste this in. So notice that that is actually what I typed in for my password. I click Submit, and I'm in. I'm now logged in as this person, and I have no idea what their password is. So if I log out and I try something else, so if I log in now, let's try Tommy. Same exact thing. Now I'm logged in as Tommy. So I was actually able to take advantage of how I'm accessing my database by plugging in these really malicious values. So this is something that actually does happen in the real world, and there are lots of sites out there uh, for which you can do this. Of course, with great power comes great responsibility, um, so be sure that you are using your powers for good, uh, to say the least. So if we jump back. So the way to prevent uh, this kind of problem, which is you know, obviously really, really bad, uh, is to sanitize our database input. And so what that means is we're basically not going to let people type in things like quote one, quote equals quote, and you know, basically these quotes are kind of at the heart of our problem. Because once we could type in that quote character, whether it be a single quote or a double quote, we could kind of end the existing SQL query and start typing whatever we wanted um, to get our own, our own SQL query that could do what we wanted it to do. So after we sanitize, our query is going to look something more along the lines of this. And so notice here how I've basically just added these forward slash things in front of this quote, this quote, this one, and this one. And remember, these were the quotes that I actually typed in as my username. So what I just did was I said, OK, before I plug in this value into the query, I'm going to, those quotes are gone. Like We're not going to let them in at all. So now, by replacing every just quote with this other random thing here, this slash quote, I've done something called escaping it. And that means when the database gets a query like this, notice now how I didn't really rewrite the SQL query. What we're now actually going to do is we're going to literally look for someone with this username. So that has the added advantage of saying, well, I'm not going to prevent you from picking that as your username, because if you're really weird, you might be really attached to this username. And I'm going to let you do that. But now, when you try to use that username in a SQL query, I'm not going to kind of have my query hijacked by you. I'm going to kind of treat it as it's supposed to be treated. So these slash quotes are just treated differently than these other quotes here. So this slash quote is treated as kind of one character. We're saying that this is now looking for a quote inside of a row, not kind of chopping off the SQL query and doing something malicious. So does that make sense, how we're sanitizing the input and preventing something bad from happening? Okay. So, yeah. Question? Yeah, I just had a question about that. Um, what? Sorry, the thing that the user typed about. Yeah. Uh, did you use any kind of reunion file where you store like the new parts so they're not in either order that you have to make them more? Yeah, exactly. So now there, there's only one condition. We're saying where the username is this thing here. Yeah. We're no longer kind of writing our own SQL, we're only filling in the blank. So now there's not these two things going on, there's just one. Yeah, and that's exactly what we're doing with escaping. So another thing we can do uh, is basically set some different permissions on our databases. So much like you know, when you, you log into maybe a shared account on a, a shared computer somewhere, you know, usually your account has some permissions associated with it. You, know, you can't log into someone else's account, you can't see their files. So that means there's some permissions associated with what you can do. So we have the same notion with our databases. We have different users that can log into the databases, and each of those users can have different permissions. And so one thing we can do is we can not give any permissions to people who don't need them. So for example, if I know people are going to be running a query that selects information, we probably don't need to give them permission to delete all of Facebook. And so again, this is just kind of another high-level thing we can do uh, to protect against these attacks. And so this uh, is the URL of the super secure discussion board. 
um, that I was just derping around on. Uh, we're going to leave this up you know, indefinitely. So as you're reading through the recaps or kind of reviewing your notes, definitely go to the site and try plugging in some different values. You know, try performing a SQL injection. Actually log in as someone else in the database. Or you know, perform an XSS attack that makes a pop-up for everyone. Um, if you notice that the site gets too annoying, uh, feel free to like, post on the discussion board or email me, and I'll wipe the database so that it's a fresh start again. Um, I would ask, though, if you do know how to do a lot of damage, please don't, because it'll make the course worse for everyone else who's trying to access the problem set and things like that. And I'll be not very happy, and we'll see next week how I can probably figure out who it was that did that. <laughs> OK. So now that we've sufficiently scared you into not blowing up my server, uh, let's talk a little bit about encrypting text. And so we saw, you know, before, we looked at HTTPS, and we said, OK, great, HTTPS is this magic black box for taking something that's not secure and making it secure. So now let's actually look at how we can do that by looking at different ways of actually encrypting information. So remember, encrypting information is just some way of scrambling the data so that when it passes through some public area and everyone can kind of look at it, that you know, everyone looking at it can't figure out what sensitive data is contained in there. So one of the simplest ways uh, of encrypting text is called the Caesar cipher. This is, you know, as its name suggests, is pretty, pretty old. Uh, and it's also really simple, but it can be surprisingly effective. So the idea behind the Caesar cipher is we're going to take our alphabet of letters, A through Z, and we're going to say, every time you see an A, make that a B. Every time you see a B, make that a C, and so on. And so what we can do is we can basically shift the value of each letter in the alphabet. So let's say uh, that my cipher looks like this. So up at the top here, I just have every letter, hopefully every letter, in order uh, of the alphabet. If that's not the case, I'm sorry. And down the bottom here, what we've done is we've shifted the location of each letter 13 times. So you notice here that the A has been moved over 13 places. And then we start at the B, we move the B over, blah, we move the B over. 13 places, we moved this, took the C, moved it over 13 places, and so on. And so we've just kind of rotated our alphabet to get something else. And so now, with this cipher, we can say, every time you see an A, well, that's an N. Every B is an O, and so on. So now, when I transmit information, someone viewing it is just going to see this totally scrambled thing, and they're not really going to have any idea what to do with it. So this could be called uh, ROT13 because I'm rotating each letter 13 times. So really, I can pick whatever I want for this value. I can rotate by 2, by 10, or really whatever I want. And just in, this, in this example, we just pick 13. So let's say that we want to take this rot 13. We want to encrypt the word banana. So what we need to do then is for every letter in this word, we just need to look up what the corresponding letter in our table was. So that means that you know, this B, we look back at our table, the B is going to become an O, the A is going to become an N, and so on. And so the encrypted version happens to look like this. So unfortunately, with this ROT13 cipher, it, it still kind of, kind of looks like the word banana. Um, so we might want to pick a different one. But this is now a different version of the information. This is now scrambled, and it's different from the original sensitive word that we wanted to encrypt. So now we can go ahead and transmit this to someone else, and anyone who's kind of looking at what this is along the way can't guarantee that they can actually figure out what it is. So now, is that it? Like, is, is a Caesar cipher totally secure? Like, how, how might someone be able to attack or, or crack this encryption? So the suggestion is here, but what might this mean? Yeah, do you have an idea? Yeah, so that's, so that's actually an even better idea than what this is. So what you're saying is we can kind of, you, know, you can kind of take a look at the letters in the message, kind of figure out, well, that NA, NA pattern, that happens in the word banana. So maybe let's kind of pick some things and try to figure out what it is. So what's an even, what's an even less efficient way of cracking this encryption? Yeah. Yeah, so let's try everything. So how many things do we have to try? Yeah. 26, exactly. There are only 26 letters in the alphabet. So if we rotate something by seven, uh, 27, th 27 slots, that's exactly the same as rotating it as one slot, because we're just going to kind of wrap around. So that means that there are only 26 different things that we need to try. 
So given some message like onenen, or whatever that word was, if I just try every single key and I look at what happens when I rotate the letters by one, by two, by three, at least one of those times I'm going to figure out what the original message is. So now really the only challenge for me is that I need to figure out which of those is the actual message. But you know, for a pretty long message, probably only one of those is going to be the case. So that means that in order for someone to decrypt some of the information that I've encrypted with this cipher, they're going to need some kind of key. They're going to need to know how much I rotated each character by. So really then, we have, if I'm sending this to my friend Alice, we need to actually agree on what our key is going to be in advance. right? Because if Alice just gets some garbled text, then she'll kind of have to try every key, and, and she's not going to be able to decrypt the information. But if I tell her, hey, the message I'm going to send you tomorrow is going to be encrypted with a key of 13, then she can use this information that we're sharing, because we're both going to use this 13, then she can actually decrypt the information. So without this key, she has to kind of brute force attack it and try everything, which is kind of the equivalent of just cracking the code. So by the way, uh, what happens if I do this? Why might ROT26 encryption not be the best idea? What will that do? Yeah, so this will do nothing. It'll make every A an A, every B a B. And so maybe, I, maybe next time I'll try ROT52, which, which is twice as secure as ROT26, uh, and so on. So the Caesar cipher then, it, you know, it's nice, but it's kind of really easily crackable, right? It just took us 26 tries. That's going to take a computer no time at all to give you all 26 different possibilities for your message. So let's try a different cipher, uh, this time called the Visionaire cipher. What the Visionaire cipher is going to try to do, it's going to say, well, the problem with Caesar is that it only took you 26 keys, and then you were done. So what we, what we want to do instead is kind of give you a larger number of keys that you could have to possibly try. So let's say we want to take this word banana again. We want to encrypt it. So last time, we said every letter, I want you to shift over 13 places. What Visionaire is going to say is, OK, we're not going to do the same thing to every letter, because that was kind of silly. Let's try doing something different to each letter in our original text. So by the way, this top thing here is called the clear text, because it's something that we can read. It hasn't been encrypted. And once we encrypt it, we'll get something called the cipher text, which is just kind of the scrambled up version that's hard to read. So now, what are we going to get here? If we, if we take the letter B and we add 2 to it, what letter are we going to get? Yes, yeah, so we're going to get D. So we have C and then D. So now, rather than doing that again to A, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to shift A over by four places, or rather, a different thing. We're going to shift A over by four places now, the N over by six places, and so on. And so with this different type of encryption, we get something that looks a little more secure. right? Like with onenen, we kind of had a guess of what that could be, where this looks nothing like the word banana. So maybe this is a little bit more secure. And the way that this is more secure is because my key now is not just this single number. Now my key is this sequence of numbers and you need you know, more than just one piece of information. Right? You need every number in this sequence in order to decrypt it. Right? You know, having just the first two numbers but not the six might be kind of helpful, but in order to totally decrypt it, you're going to need the whole key. So it might be kind of annoying uh, to have to send someone this series of numbers. So what we can do instead is kind of take a page out of the ASCII playbook. So remember with ASCII, we basically said every letter has a corresponding number. And so vice versa, every number has a corresponding letter. So before we said, you know, capital A is going to be 65, lowercase a is going to be 97. Now it's probably totally arbitrary at the time, and it still is. Um, so let's make this a little bit simpler. Now we're going to say every, the number 0 corresponds to an A, the number 1 corresponds to a B, the number 2 corresponds to a C, and so on. So that means that my key then can be something that looks like a word. Right, so before we just had these numbers, but I just said, OK, this number 2 corresponds to a C, this number 4 corresponds to an E, and so on. And so in this sense, I'm kind of adding letters together, where we start off with some letter. And then this other letter here, this C, is just going to represent how much we're going to shift that original letter. And so this is just a different way of expressing the same exact information. We're doing the same thing, we're just you know, adding positions to letters. But maybe this word is a little bit easier to remember than 246. So this probably CEG is probably not any easier to remember than 246. So let's try another one. So we have the plain text computer. 
And now what we want to do is we want to encrypt it using this key here. So now we have words. My key is just uh, Ben RJ. And each letter in this key, remember, just corresponds to a different shift. So here's what we can look like. So notice here that we, our plain text here is longer than our key. So what we need to do then is we need to repeat it over and over again. So that means that you know, if our keyword is longer and it's longer than our plain text, we might not use the entire key. OK, so I have my plain text computer, and I'm adding the key Ben RJ. So what is the first letter I'm going to get? Yeah, I'm going to get a D, because we said a B represents a shift of 1. So the first letter in my message is a D. Then what's next? This one's a little harder. Yeah, so then we have an S, because how many did you shift over to get the S? Yeah, so we shifted 4, because E is the fifth letter in the alphabet, but we started counting at 0, so that was 4. So one more. What's this last one going to be? Or sorry, the, the M, what does that become? So close, this one's going to be a Z. So the A actually represents a 0, so just off by 1 there. So we're going to end up with a message that looks like this. So now, in order for someone to decrypt this, I need to not only tell them the encrypted ciphertext, but I also need to tell them the key that I use to encrypt it. Because I know that I use the key Ben RJ, but if somebody tries to decrypt this using the key RJ Ben, it's not going to work, right? Because we're just going to get something that's totally scrambled, and we're not going to be any better than we were to start off with. So it's really important that both parties share this same information. And this kind of general family of techniques is called symmetric, symmetric key cryptography. There is one key, and we're both sharing it. And that's what this series of really big words, that's all that this is saying. Two parties share some information, and that shared information is used to encrypt data. So Caesar and Visionaire uh, were kind of crappy. So some better ones that exist now are things called Blowfish or AES, uh, which is used by people like the Department of Defense and other things like that. And they're basically more sophisticated ways of encrypting information. But they're really just following the same exact principles. We're just taking some letters, we're shifting them over using some key, and we're getting back something that looks like garbage. So by the way, why is the Visionaire cipher more secure than the Caesar cipher. So we saw with the Caesar cipher that I needed 26 different tries to brute force it. How many tries do I need with the Visionaire cipher? A lot, so why? Yeah, exactly. So for the, first, for the first letter in my key, there's 26 possible things. For the second letter of my key, there's another 26 possible things. Now we're looking at 26 squared combinations. And so we're going to end up with a really big number really, really fast. So does that mean that a longer key is more secure? Yes or no? So why? So why? Yeah, so it definitely creates more time needed to crack it, which is kind of being more secure. Right, so if you know, an attacker has two choices. It has a password that it thinks is two or three characters, and a password that could be as many as 30 characters. It can crack that smaller one much, much faster. So if we use a longer key, we're going to end up with something that takes longer to crack. And if we're just using this brute, forth, brute force methods, it could take a much longer time. So here's just a, you know, visually what's going on here. We have some key that's shared between the two parties. And I'm using that key now to encrypt some information, encrypt and decrypt some information. So that's just one way of encrypting information. So now let's take a look at this other thing called asymmetric key cryptography. And can anyone guess, based on the word, the difference between symmetric key cryptography and asymmetric key cryptography? What did adding the A to the word do? Yeah, so what does that mean? So what do you mean by the opposite? Yeah, so that means that rather than sharing a key, I can have different keys. So the, this party doesn't need to share just this one piece of information. Because the problem with symmetric key cryptography is that if we're just sharing this one piece of information, if someone finds out, we're in a lot of trouble. Because that's all they need to decrypt everything we've done. So it's really this kind of vulnerability with transmitting to you that I'm using ROT13. Someone figures out that 13, doesn't matter what the heck I do, 
with my encryption, I'm in trouble because they have the key. So asymmetric key cryptography tries to solve this problem by you know, removing that shared secret. So rather than have one key, asymmetric is going to use these things called public and private keys. So as their name suggests, these are just two different things. One of them you can share with the entire world. So if I wanted to send you my public key, I could do that and nothing bad would happen. But my private key is something that only I know. So even if I'm sending a message to Alice, I do not tell Alice my private key. I can give her my public key, and that's fine, because everyone has that anyway. But this is something that I'm going to keep to myself. So we can see here with these public and private keys, we don't have this vulnerability of, of transmitting some information secretly, because there just is no secret information that's shared between two people anymore. So encrypting a uh, message using some, an asymmetric technique might look something like this. So here, Alice wants to send a message to Bob. And at a high level, Bob is going to take Bob, uh, sorry, Alice is going to take Bob's public key. And this is public to the whole entire world. And she's somehow going to use that key to encrypt the message. However, when Bob receives this message, which is now encrypted and nobody can read it, he's not going to use his public key to decrypt it. Because right? that would totally defeat the purpose. If his, if his key is public, then anyone can just decrypt it. Instead, this message can only be decrypted when Bob gives his private key. And so that means that anyone can read this message, but it can't be decrypted until you supply the correct private key. And so this seems a little weird. Like, how, how can we achieve something like that? And the answer is, is we kind of can't, um, but we can try really hard. And the way we can try really hard is with these things called one-way functions. So a one-way function is basically an operation that's really, really hard to reverse. For example, if you take a bat to a window and break it, it's really, really hard to reverse that operation. But it really wasn't hard at all to take a bat to the window. Like, that was really, really simple. So going in one direction was very difficult, but undoing that and going in the other direction is really, really hard. So rather than take a bat to Alice's window, uh, let's make Alice multiply some numbers. So I have here two prime numbers. And a prime number just means that it isn't divisible by anything except one or itself. So just some, some math that doesn't matter too much. And it's really easy for a computer to multiply these two numbers. Right? If I just pull out a calculator and type this in, I'm going to get a result. And so that was pretty easy. But now, what if you want to undo this operation? So if I just give you this big, huge number here and say, I want you to factor this. But because I just multiplied two prime numbers, there are only two numbers that can possibly multiply together to get this number, if you don't count this number in one. So if I just say to you, hey, you know, here, here's a message. I want you to factor this. What do you do? Yeah, you, you hope so nobody does that in the first place, because you really have no idea. Like The only way to do this is to basically go through and try every possible combination of prime numbers uh, until you get something. And so it turns out that it's not just that we're bad at this, but computers are pretty bad at this too. We haven't actually figured out a good way to do this. You know, these numbers here aren't too big, but if we pick some giant prime numbers, multiply them, multiply them together to get an even more giant number, factoring that into those two original primes is really, really difficult. And so this is an operation that's really hard to undo. And undoing it is just going to take a lot of time. But to be fair, this actually is one of the greatest unsolved problems and we're facing in computer science. You know, problems like this, these one-way things, is there any way to solve them as efficiently as we can check them? Right? It's really easy to check that two numbers together multiply to this one number, but it was really hard to figure out what those two numbers are. And so we don't know right now if there's a way to do this. And some really smart people are convinced that there is no way to do this. But if someone even smarter comes along and figures out how to do this, we are in a lot of trouble because all of our cryptography is based on this entire idea. Um, so let's hope that uh, nobody does that. OK, so one algorithm that uses this is called RSA. And this is uh, the same idea that we're going to use with HTTPS. We're going to have some public key, and we're going to have a private key. And this just uses a lot of scary math in order to actually encrypt and decrypt numbers. But all of it is based on this fact that you can multiply two prime numbers together really easily, but you cannot factor them easily at all. So let's take a look at a different uh, algorithm now. You've probably been wondering why the table has been here for so long. Uh, so have I. So here is a different algorithm that's going to take advantage of a different type of one-way operation. So can I have two volunteers? This is a non-speaking role. 
So nothing to be embarrassed about. Yeah, so one. Anyone else? Awesome. So we have two. OK, so Ben is going to be uh, our third volunteer here. Hi, Ben. So what's your name again? Julia. Julia, and what's your name? Brennan. Julia and Brennan. OK, so if Julia wants to stay on this side, stand on this side of the table, and Brennan's going to be on this side of the table. So what we want to do now is we, we want to kind of combine these two ideas between symmetric and asymmetric key cryptography. So we said the problem with symmetric key cryptography is we needed some way for Julia and Brennan to agree on some shared key. So the problem they're facing is they have in front of them some paint and a paintbrush, and they need to figure out a way to share some secret between them. So what we want to do is we want to figure out a color that only Julia and Brennan are aware of. So Ben is going to be watching this whole process. So any th information that Julia and Brennan exchange, Ben is going to see. So our process looks like this. So here we have a plate with a paintbrush. Uh, I'm not artsy, but I have a friend who is, so that worked out well. And both Julia and Brennan have chosen some public color. So they both picked the color red. And they're going to announce that to the world, that they have picked the color red, and the world is really excited to hear that. So Ben knows that they picked the color red. So this is kind of like our public key, right? It's just something that we're, we're broadcasting to the entire world. So in addition to their public key, Julie and Brandon have also each chosen a private color. So they went to their paint collection and they picked their favorite color, but they're not telling anyone what that color is. So this is our private key. It's information that only they know, and they're not going to tell anyone, including each other. So with our public key and our private key, we're going to uh, perform a one-way function. So let me shut this off for lighting. So the one-way function we're going to perform is mixing together these two paint colors. So, right, so once I mix together two colors of paint, it's going to be really hard for you to tell me exactly what shade of red and what shade of blue were used to make purple. And as we saw, you need to tell me exactly what shades they were in order to decrypt the message. So here, if we take a paintbrush here, and we just want to take a little bit of uh, your private color and public color and mix it together, and then same thing, just take a little bit of your private color and your public color, and you're going to mix it together to form a new color. OK, so right now, so just to recap, Ben does not know what the private color is, because they haven't told anyone. But Ben does know what their public color is, because that's kind of what they started off with. OK, so now Julie and Brennan have this new color. And what they're going to do is they're going to exchange colors. So if you two want to swap plates now, so now they're exchanging some information. And that means that Ben has, exchange, has seen this information exchange. So can anyone tell me, what are the three things that Ben knows right now? So what's the first, what's the first thing we said we told everybody? What was that? Yeah, so the public key or the public color. So that's one thing. So they just exchanged two colors. So that means that Ben knows what? Yeah, so not, yeah, so not only that they exchanged, but what they exchanged. So Ben has the public color yellow. He has Julia's mixed color, which is something like a nice orange, and Brennan's mixed color, which is kind of a dark blue or purpley thing. OK, so that's what Ben has. And now what we're going to do is we're going to get some more of the private color. So Julia started off with the private color yellow, and Brennan started off with the private color blue. And again, they didn't tell anyone about this. So now as a third step, take your private color and mix it with the color that you received. Yeah, so we ended up with kind of a, actually, do you want to do some more yellow? Just because we ended up with more blue than yellow. So luckily, computers will know exactly how much paint to add. Kay. OK, so what just happened? What, what are the three colors that Julia has right now? What three colors did she mix together? The public color. What are the other two ones? Her private color and the mixture of his colors. So now what about Brennan? So what did he just mix together? Public color. 
the mixture of hers and his private. So what does that mean about the two colors that Julia and Brennan have sitting in front of them right now? They're the same. Exactly. Because we had three colors, yellow, blue, and red. And Julia started off with yellow, added some, uh, started off with red, added some yellow, mixed it together, and then Brennan did the same thing. He started off with the public, mixed in his private, and then eventually mixed in the mixture of Julia's colors. So that means that the two colors that they've mixed together are exactly the same. So now let's, let's see what Ben has. So Ben has the public color, and he has the mixture of the two colors. So can Ben, does Ben have any idea of, fig, of any way to figure out what the color that Julia and Brennan ended up with? Yeah, so, could, so I mean, Ben can see it, but if Ben only has that information, there's really no way for him to figure out what the two colors are, right? He can mix together the two mixtures, he can add in as much of the public key as he want, and that's just not going to do anything. And so that means that Julia and Brennan have just exchanged some secret information without Ben having any idea what just happened. So the colors in the plates are a little bit, there. they're kind of close, and we end up having more blue than modern yellow, but if we mixed in, you know, the same amounts, we'd, we'd end up with the same color. And so that means that this is how Julia and Brennan just agreed on a secret color that they can now use the secret color to en encrypt other colors or other things like that. But there's no way for Ben, the prying eyes, to figure out how they agreed on this secret color. So thank you very much for volunteering. So anyone have questions on what just happened there? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So Julia has no idea what Brennan's private key was. Because he sent only a mixture, there's no way to kind of go from that mixture to the original private key. So yeah, so that's important to note. We've also preserved the other thing we promised we preserved, and that's even in this exchange, we don't risk giving up our private key. So this algorithm, or this, this way of exchanging information, uh, is named after Diffie-Hellman. And this is actually a really common way uh, for two computers using something like AES or an actual secure symmetric key encryption algorithm to agree on some kind of shared key. They're obviously not emailing paint to each other, uh, but this is basically the same idea. All right. So any questions at all uh, on the cryptography that we just saw before we shift gears a little bit? So by the way, just, just one question. So we saw before uh, in this diagram here that We're using the public key to encrypt information, but we're using the private key to decrypt information. What if we swap these two things? What if Alice encrypts something with her, pub, uh, with her private key and then gives it to Bob, or gives her corresponding public key to Bob? Any guesses on like, what that would allow us to do? And so this would be kind of the equivalent of Alice signing her name on the message. So we could say that you know, the only way to get Alice's signature is to use her public key. And there's no way to forge Alice's signature because only she knows her private key. So then, given this public key, we could basically verify that this is Alice's signature. So this is kind of a, a different problem, um, but using the same application of a public key and a private key. So we want to encrypt information. This is what we'll do. We'll use the public key, and only I can decrypt it. But we might also want to verify that this actually came from Alice. Right, you know, a couple weeks ago, we saw the phishing attack in which I looked like an email looked like it came from Barack Obama. And I, you know, I didn't really have any idea of verifying whether or not it came from Barack Obama. But instead, a technique like this could be used to verify that a message you received actually came from a trusted source, because they've attached their digital signature, as it's called, to the message using some private information that only they have. Yeah. Yeah, so how does this process actually work? It's unfortunately a whole lot of crazy math. Um, but it basically re re revolves around the fact that this public key is kind of, you know, this public key uses effectively the product of two prime numbers. And so the only way to go from this resulting product to the original thing is going to be with the two factors of those prime numbers. So the math ends up being, you know, it's not that straightforward. That's kind of a simplified version. Uh, but it's super, super crazy. Uh, but the basic idea is just kind of this. Uh, but feel free to read up on RSA, and we'll post a video, uh, a nice video explanation of how RSA works 
uh, if you're curious. So it's actually really cool, but a lot of math. OK, so in the last few minutes here, and we'll finish this up next week, uh, let's just shift gears and talk about, rather than online threats, but kind of threats to your computer locally. So has anyone seen this word malware before? So what are some types of malware? Yeah, so a keylogger. What's a keylogger? Yeah, exactly. So a keylogger basically records every single thing you type on the keyboard, and it could send it off to somebody. So that means that if you type in your password to Facebook.com, and someone's looking at the logs of your keyboard, they might see that you typed Facebook.com, and then you type this other thing, they could probably guess that that's your password, since you're probably not going to type anything else between Facebook.com, your username, and your password. So what are some other types of malware that maybe you know, your computer's been hit by, or your friend or family member's computer's been hit by, and kind of did some damage that you weren't so happy about? So viruses. So, so what's a virus? Um, it's, it's, it's something that's like a program that basically um, I guess that can be like secure for your computer, you know, um, because it's you don't know what it is. And uh, and it can be attacked from computers, you know, computers to computer network devices. Yeah, exactly. So a virus then is just some you know, a malicious program that could do something like delete all the files in your computer or change your home page, something that's not about cats or something like that. Um, but usually viruses work by kind of attaching themselves to some existing file or program. And once you open that up, you're going to kind of let the virus loose on your computer. So someone might email you kind of a sketchy looking executable or a Word document or a PDF. And once you open that up, the virus is kind of let go onto your computer and free to do some pretty destructive stuff. So how about some other ones? Some other afflictions of your computer. So what's that? So what's that? Yeah, so this sounds like it could be like a, something a virus does. Right? So what it could do is a virus, you know, is some program and once you've let it free, you know, it can kind of do whatever it wants. And so something the virus could do is incite a phishing attack. So every time you, know, you go to bank.com, the virus redirects you to like bank.com or you know, some, uh, something else that looks kind of like bank.com, but not quite. So if the site you go to looks exactly the same as what you're used to, you know, maybe this looks a little bit different, but it looks like the banking site I'm used to, and you start typing in your password and your bank account number, that means someone could actually be stealing all that information. And so this is pretty similar to the phishing attack that we looked at last week. So a virus could be used to kind of you know, trap you into a phishing attack. So yeah, definitely. Other ones? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so, so could, a, could a malicious site also masquerade as a secure site? So sure, getting that HTTPS on your web server is something really anyone can do. And it costs something like $100 a year, but all that means is that the information from your computer to that server is going to be encrypted. So unfortunately, that little green padlock doesn't have any guarantees of security. Right? Like, as we saw before in our CSERF example, the site was using HTTPS, and that was cool, but we we're still very vulnerable to a cross-site request forgery attack. So really, anyone who owns a domain name can also get a certificate and become HTTPS and get a little padlock in Chrome. But unfortunately, that doesn't guarantee that your site is actually secure. So before we finish up, maybe one more type uh, of malware that you've seen before? Yeah. Yeah, so, so maybe someone can execute, you know, send a script to you that when executed runs some malicious code that does something. So yeah, so that could be a virus. It could also be something called a worm, uh, which we'll look at next time. One of the most you know, devastating and first worms on the internet um, could have been written exactly like that. Um, so we'll take a look at the different types of malware as well as uh, some additional protections uh, against malware next week. Um, but any other questions before we finish up? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Spyware, spyware is it definitely falls under the malware category. So does adware, which is kind of like a type of spyware. 
Um, and spyware, as we'll see, is just this kind of thing that can watch everything you do. So the keylogger example might be a type of spyware. Someone's collecting information about you. That information might be kind of harmless, like what you search for on Amazon.com, or maybe not so harmless, depending on what you search for. Or it could be very harmless, like the bank account number you typed into bankofamerica.com. Um, so stay tuned for next week. We'll finish up our discussion of security and then move on to privacy and some defenses against the attacks that we've talked about a little bit.